Welcome to Blood and Cancer. I'm your host, Dr. David Henry. We continue each week to try and bring you clinically relevant issues in our wonderful specialty of hematology and oncology, hence the name, Blood and Cancer. And I'm delighted to be speaking today with Dr. Alyssa Wolberg, who is PhD, Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Wolberg, thanks for joining us for today's podcast. Thank you very much for having me. This is a, this is a really exciting opportunity. Well, thank, thank you very much. Same for me. So I remember very well, as I was telling you, I spent that this first December weekend in my home office where I am now, listening to all of ASH. And then I think a day or so later, you participated in the best of ASH, which was tricky in the best of times, let alone in COVID time. And so what I thought we would do, and you've been so kind to step us through, some of the, you chose a number of abstracts, but some I thought mostly interesting to clinicians, practitioners, would be four abstracts I chose. So without further ado, let me give you the intro to each one. You can tell me what you thought about it and what was the clinical relevance or what we should take home. It was abstract 572 was the first one entitled Association of ABO Blood Group with Bleeding Severity in Patients with Bleeding of Unknown Cause. What did you take home from this one? Um, I really like this one. Um, all the abstracts that I, I looked at, I, I liked a lot because of the potential impact and sort of an interesting quirk to, to what it was that they were showing, something that made me look at the world a little bit differently. And, and this one was, was right there at the top. Um, the, they, they started with an observation that I think everybody accepts to a certain extent, ABO blood group um, uh, and its relationship to certain blood coagulation factors, von Willebrand factor and factor eight in particular, and looked at bleeding and bleeding of unknown cause, which is a major clinical challenge and um, got the answer one might have predicted that type O blood group, which is associated with low von Willebrand factor and low fact, lower factor eight levels was more prevalent in these bleeders than in the non-bleeders, patients who bleed versus patients that don't uh, um, have a history of bleeding. And um, that might have been a, where the story ended. I thought that was really interesting, but they looked further and that's what really made it interesting. And what they showed is that the um, the von Willebrand factor and factor eight don't seem to account when they controlled for those things, they still saw changes in these patients with increased bleeding risk or bleeding of unknown cause um, that remain unknown. And so the abstract didn't end with the answer to the story, but in fact gave rise to further questions. It sort of reframed how people go about looking at bleeding of unknown cause and eliminated what I think a lot of us had just assumed would probably um, help shed light on the answer and, and really illuminated what we don't know about that setting. And I, that sort of captivated me and captivated um, my thinking and made me dive into the literature while I was uh, preparing the slides for that abstract and to see what else I could learn and what other clues there might be. Uh, I, I thought that was a really interesting way to, to show what findings they had and, and, and where that particular science is headed. So I thought so too. And they, um, again, from their abstract, they said platelet function, no difference. So it's all somewhere in the clotting factor or contact, or at least not the cellular system. But as you said, it's not just from Willebrand factor and factor eight, not the whole story. It's not the whole story. And that's near and dear to my heart, having spent a lot of years studying plasma um, clotting. You, when they looked at just the clot itself, physically the clot, it was different. And when they looked at um, the way the clot resisted lysis and its structure, those were the things that were different. And on some level, that's a, a really straightforward thing that can be figured out. You know, if it had been cells and flow and a lot of complex um, contributors, we, it, it's a challenging thing to try to understand that in the laboratory and do um, experiments on that. But when they can observe this in the plasma, that has a certain intrigue to it because it's an accessible tissue and, and is readily available for study. And, and I thought that was, that, that was interesting. There's something else in the plasma itself that's doing this and, and it's there for the discovery. Fascinating. So for all of us in practice, there's still something different about our GLOB, blood group O patients with bleeding. It's not just from Willebrand's and or factor eight and more to come in this neat story. Okay, so next of four, number two, I thought was interesting, number 203, racial ethnic disparities 
and cancer-associated thrombosis, a population-based study. So what do you think of this one? I, um, I really appreciated this one. I don't know if it was apparent. I hope it was very apparent that there was a lot of thought that went into planning the sessions for ASH this year to really um, recognize disparity as a, 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 an item that we need to attend to, that it's no longer sufficient to just look at the biology and biochemistry strictly, but we need to take a more holistic look um, and understand the relationships between um, the hematologic complications and, and health disparities in a number of ways from the, the, um, the, the population of physicians doing the, the kinds of decision-making and treatment to the patients who are receiving the care. And this one really helped highlight that in the, in the non-malignant um, hematology realm, looking at thrombosis in cancer. And it, it, it's funny, it began with, an, again, an interesting premise that the risks of thrombosis in cancer patients is high enough that, you know, the way the abstract was framed, they thought it might swamp out effects of race in terms of thrombosis risk. And in fact, it, it didn't really suggesting that race um, plays this major um, role and should be taken into consideration, both in terms of trying to understand more about what actually is going on, and then also whether or not it, it should be information that's incorporated into risk prediction, which has a direct translational potential for understanding um, who should receive uh, additional care, increase prophylaxis, and things like that. So and do you I think that there are data that uh, was more access to care or genetic disparity or all of the above? It didn't document that, and I think I think for very good reasons. It documented that the the relative risk of thrombosis is higher in African Americans and lower in um, Asian Pacific Islanders, um, but didn't at the end um, uh, determine why that is. And of course, I think it's easy to speculate biology. That's sort of a go-to term, but. The, the fact is that race is a societal social construct and there's a lot more, it's not simply biology, but it's everything that is folded into being um, a, a human being in a society that is filled with structures, infrastructure that um, promote differences to, in access to care and, and, um, and, and just differences in, in perception and the way society holds individuals and they and they raise that point um, in in the abstract that institutional racism access to care differences in um, genetics there, there's it's really hard to determine exactly what accounts for these differences um, but it's important for us to begin to try to understand these and it may take interdisciplinary collaborations to really elucidate what exactly is going on um, in that setting and so I think in that respect as well it gives rise to further work that needs to be done to really understand what's going on. Yeah, so as they say, the data is the data. So there certainly is this higher in African-American and you could hold this or that variable constant, maybe have access to care or study genetics and other factors to try and tease this out. So yeah, it was a huge database, uh, hundreds of thousands of patients included in their, their database study. It was, it was a massive database. Um, the, I think number of registries from the California um, database and, and, and several of them that really yielded a robust data set and allowed them to explore, I believe it was 13 different kinds of cancer and really um, understand um, to a very detailed level in particular ca specific cancers that um, show more health disparities versus others. Um, that's more information that's going to need to be teased out as well. I think that was an interesting. Um, and as you say, I'm thinking uh, as a clinician, uh, we know prophylaxis in hospital post BTE, but not the cancer patient who hasn't had thrombosis yet. And so the Karana data set is one of them or the Karana formula uh, is helpful and other formulas, but doesn't yet address all of this. And so maybe that needs to be folded into a, a new algorithm. Mm -hmm. So the next, the third one I thought was most interesting and something I see a lot, number 424, suboptimal screening for iron deficiency in pregnancy in a high resource setting. And I thought you really did a great job coming down this one in your review of Best of Ash. So what were your take homes here regarding pregnancy iron deficiency? This was really interesting. I actually learned a lot in, in reading about this abstract and trying to do a little bit of background work to be able to present it. Um, iron deficiency, I, I like the impact of this one that iron deficiency is so prevalent um, and yet so treatable. And so understanding more about 
patients that are iron deficient, how to identify them and how to best treat them has huge potential impact worldwide. And I, I thought that that was a really attractive part of the study that they're doing. But the particular piece that they grabbed is that this isn't one of those problems that we tend to um, write off in the sense that if somebody is in a, in, a, in a clinical setting where you don't have access to high quality care, um, you expect differences. But they did this in a high resource setting. They did this study in Canada and showed that even in a setting with a publicly funded healthcare system, high resource, no reason why one would expect differences in, um, in, in the level of care based on socioeconomic status, it was still there. And, and I found that to be surprising and dismaying and fascinating. And it really um, called attention to the idea that um, it's not as simple as just declaring that everybody should get a certain kind of care or funding a certain kind of care, but really understanding that that's not enough to make uh, the setting equitable. Um, so, the, so the study that they did was a really admirable study and, and difficult to do again, um, requiring databases and, um, and trying to figure out how to handle the data. But what they came out with actually is, is really critically important and is applicable, not only I suspect to high resource settings, but, but all settings. Yeah, and from their conclusion, I was just again, shocked, high, especially in this high resource setting, iron deficiency affects more than half of pregnancies in Ontario one in four pregnancies complicated by severe iron deficiency. Uh, you know, we have oral and many safe intravenous irons, some not terribly expensive, certainly in this resource setting, that wouldn't have been much of an issue. And after, tri after first trimester, we tend to happily intervene. So this is a problem, very noteworthy, very well identified, very well discussed by you, and something we can address um, and, and take home and do tomorrow to watch and talk with our obstetric colleagues where, where they tell us this can affect fetal uh, development if you allow iron deficiency to continue. So yeah, I thought that was really a worthwhile take home. And our, our last one, coming on back to COVID, uh, we can't avoid number 245, uh, efficacy of COVID-19 pathogen inactivated convalescent plasma for patients with moderate to severe acute COVID-19, a, a case match control study. And you know, I've been foolish in reading The Great Epidemic, the 1918, uh -huh. put me to sleep. And trust me, it doesn't help put you to sleep. And all they had then was uh, zeroing in on serum, sera as they called it, to try and interfere with the infections of the day. And uh -huh. in 1918, that was uh, one thing that was done out of some of the major cities uh, to come up with that antibody convalescent plasma, so to speak. So here we've come around again 100 years later. What did you think of this abstract and should everybody get convalescent plasma? Yeah, this is definitely another one that I needed to learn a lot about. This isn't in my normal realm, um, but the idea of convalescent plasma um, became really, uh, it, it, it trespassed into not just sort of clinical care and COVID, but politics. Everybody was talking about it this year. And that was one of the reasons that I really um, thought this was intriguing. The, the concept that you might take uh, plasma from a person who has recovered from COVID and give it to someone else and that it might transfer protection in form of antibodies, it seems very logical. And it, it, it seems like, of course, something like that should work. And yet the clinical trials are not um, overwhelmingly showing a lot of promise for this. And in fact, several have shown no um, benefit whatsoever. And so it was intriguing to me to think about what's going on and is it a problem with the convalescent plasma itself or in the study design or how we're going about doing that? Um, is it in fact more complicated than it sounds? And of course, everything always is. And so what intrigued me about this abstract is that they began to ask some of the specific questions having to do with the idea that not all convalescent plasma is the same and the responses of the individuals that get the plasma is not always the same and that both of these things may need to be factored in in order to understand whether the failure of the trials is simply a, a negative finding that it doesn't work, or it's a failure to show a positive finding that is because the study wasn't quite designed with the right criteria in mind. And I liked the idea that they, they discussed this, they went into um, asking some of these questions, they characterized the plasmas um, that, they, um, that they transfused they characterized antibody responses in the patients that received it. You know, at the end of it, I'm not sure that it necessarily showed 
um, whether this is going to work or not, but it began to show that there are differences in, in both sides of the equation in the plasmas and in the recipients and that and it documented that really well and um, gave, I think, future trials something to think about in terms of interpreting the data and trying to decide whether this is a viable approach or not. Yeah, exactly. I like very much what you just said, where it's both sides. The, the recipients are different in how they're going to use what they just got, and the donors are different. And I know from their abstract, 15% of convalescent plasma had ineffective antibody. What's that? That tells us a lot. Um, how you're resistant to infection, whether you're a good antibody former, is it disappearing too quickly? And uh, although they did, as you said, show it a proven in hospital mortality, not significantly so, but numerically less. Um, just another large data set to help us try and understand what's happening to not only infected patient, but how we might help someone who is infected and doing poorly, besides the other drugs we have, give them some antibody. Yeah. That's fascinating. It is fascinating. It seems like something that maybe couldn't, couldn't hurt, but it might be able to hurt. And so understanding exactly what we're doing, I think is important. And I'm, I'm interested in following to see what they learn next. Yeah, aren't, aren't we all? Well, those were the four abstracts I wanted to cover and you discussed so nicely. As a getaway question, how did it, Ash, work for you and being the best of Ash presenter? Um, how'd you come away feeling from this Ash, you know, whether without COVID notwithstanding? Yeah, this was not what I anticipated, certainly when I signed on and my, my counterpart, Dr. Keene, um, when we envisioned what ASH was going to be like, this is never what we envisioned. In retrospect, I, um, I looking back, I regret the parts that prevented me from being able to see my colleagues. There's something about that human connection that helps drive science, and we didn't get that quite like we wanted to. But I was pleased that the science went on. I think that was a testament to the community that, that the science still happened. And once I got used to the website, I found that actually pretty user friendly. Um, and as a, as a co-chair, I think I got to see a lot more of the science and of the meeting than I would have if it had been in person because I could do it more on my own time. And I appreciate the sort of equity that that brings um, to not insist that everybody have to do a talk at the same time in a given place on a given day, but to allow some flexibility. And um, hopefully that means that not just for me, but for others, the science reached more people, um, which is really what we're trying to do with this meeting is, is get the science disseminated into the field so that it can be advanced. So I, I, I feel good about it. Not, not great. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good, actually. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. I think I'll be right there in that same box. It was pretty good, not perfect. You missed the personal interaction. The uh, It's a little difficult to do the meeting from your home office because home gets in the way, yeah. um, which which doesn't happen when you're away. So with that uh, exception, I thought the meeting would, I've attended now three or four national international meetings and the electronics are being worked out and the, the science goes on and you can, pa you can pause, you know, say, gee, what did she just say? Back up uh, 10 seconds and then go forward. So it's actually an interesting, useful format. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, speaking as a member of ASH, um, thank you very much for your best of ASH and reminding our listeners who've been listening to Dr. Alyssa Wolberg, who's at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where she's professor of pathology and laboratory medicine and, and a wonderful speaker. And thank you very much for helping us navigate some of these best of ASH abstracts in 2020. Thanks so much, Dr. Wolberg. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.